guess I want to start by saying thank you to our, our seniors because I, I really enjoyed that and I think my heart needed uh, that this morning. That, whew, Jesus, 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 there's something about that name. I, that's a song that is such a beautiful marriage of words and music that makes you wonder why, like, why didn't that exist long before uh, was it Bill Gaither that wrote it? It just it seems so obvious and so beautiful. But anyway, a, a wonderful song. And I, I appreciate you all for, for helping us lead us into worship this morning. This morning, we're going to be continuing our sign on our, excuse me, our series on the signs uh, in the book of John. And, and really, this is the, the end of the series in, in its truest sense, and that it is where we sort of get to the end. Now, there was a time years ago when I was driving in Pensacola, Florida, and I, we were, I was actually not driving. I was in the back seat, and a good friend of mine was driving us to a restaurant. We had been staying in Orange Beach, and someone had recommended that we try this restaurant in Pensacola. They said, oh, it's only, you know, 20, 25 minutes away, not too long, well worth the drive. And so, our friend was driving us, and there were five or six of us in the car, um, and, and we cross over from Alabama into Florida, and as the interstate highway exits do, they started counting up, right? So just like we have exit, what, 876, 877, 870, you know, 8, right? And when you cross over in Florida, they start counting up, and we were looking for exit 4, exit 4. So that would say to us, about four miles, maybe three miles, start looking. Well, um, our, our driver didn't start looking until about exit seven. And then we got to exit eight. And he, he says, now I'm looking for exit four. And this was back before iPhones and GPS. This was in the day of printed MapQuest directions. Right, so like we, you know, the lady in the front seat, his wife is there and she says, you know, you're looking for exit four and we're passing exit eight and everybody in the back seat is starving because there is, I've learned in life, a correlation between how hungry you are and how lost you get when looking for a restaurant. Um, and so we get we're at like exit 11 or something before he turns around and says, well, I must have missed it. And everyone, like the resounding chorus in the car is, yes, you missed it. And we're starving. But he turns around. We get there to the restaurant eventually. And the thing is, is about signs is that there are some things you have to understand about signs. You have to understand what the signs mean. You have to understand how to, to read the signs. You need to be able to use the signs um, and multiple signs working in conjunction to get you to your destination. Now, the signs in the Gospel of John, we've seen seven of them. And each one of them is God revealing who Jesus truly is. Each one of them is pointing very clearly to say, this is who Jesus is and at the same time that each of them independently points to who Jesus is, as a group, they lead us to a conclusion, not just of who Jesus is, but really to the nature of, of God, of his character, of his love for creation, of his plan for salvation for us, but also his plan for the redemption of the entire created order. All of these signs, when seen in the right order, in the right perspective, they all, they lead us to a conclusion. And I want to talk about that conclusion today. Because all of these signs have been pointing us, I think, to what we see in John chapter 20. This is the story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, each version of the resurrection, each of the four stories in the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's one gospel told from four perspectives, and each of them, when they tell the story of the resurrection, they'll have different details that they point out. In fact, each of them also kind of talks about different people being present for the events of the resurrection, which should make sense to us if you've ever tried to tell somebody about something that happened in the past. 
you know, you might remember that you went to a birthday party and you'll remember these four people were there and, and your spouse, right, remember these other two people being there because you were, you know, in the kitchen helping get things ready and he was off in the garage doing who knows what. And so he just hung out with two other guys in the garage and you saw all the people, but you have different perspectives. And so one of the things that we see unique about the story of the resurrections as depicted in each of the gospels is sort of the guest list. John puts special emphasis on one person and that is the person of Mary Magdalene. A few things that the scriptures tell us about Mary Magdalene that may be important to us as we look at her role in this chapter of the text is that, number one, is that we initially meet her in Luke chapter 8. It tells a story that Jesus encountered Mary Magdalene and that she was possessed by seven demons. And the way that this is expressed, that she is possessed by seven demons... Seven in the, in the scripture, it, it is sort of the number of, of completion, that something is, is whole. And so it says seven demons, not to say that it was only seven, but that it was a complete possession, that she was not herself, right? that she had completely lost herself to the possession of these demons, and that Jesus frees her from that. He frees her from that, and afterwards, that she follows Jesus, and we see her appear in stories moving forward in the text. And then we also know that she, be, she is a woman of some means, that she is, has some wealth, because it says that she was one of the people that supported Jesus' ministry as he and the disciples were moving place to place, that, that she was one of the people who bankrolled their ministry. We also know that she was present for the death of Jesus. That when many of the disciples, when most of the disciples fled in fear, that she was faithful. And that she stayed there and she watched the man who set her free die a criminal's death. And she watched them as they took his body down. And she followed them to the tomb where his body was lain. And she had dedicated herself to taking care of his remains from that point forward. Like she was there. And she wanted to be there through the very end. And so in John chapter 20, verse 1, Mary is making good on the commitment to care for his body and says this, On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She, so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Now right here we see a point of connection with the other Gospels. She says, it tells us that she was there early, but then when she talks to the disciples, she says, we don't know where they have taken him, which means she wasn't alone there. Sometimes critics of the scripture will say, look, they can't even agree about who went to, to dress Jesus' body for final internment. It talking about her. It's, this is her version of the story, but she says we. There are other people there with her. And her concern is that this body is, is gone, that they don't know where it has been taken because she is thinking that she wants to take care of Jesus' body. She wants to make sure, she wants to show him that respect, that honor to take care of his body. And so in, then in verse 3, in verse 3, John, the author of this text, who is, refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved or the other disciple, he, he does something here that I think is, is really funny. Like, I, I think it, it's really funny. And I know that this part of the text, we don't normally see humor when we're talking about the, the crucifixion and resurrection, but there's something really funny here because remember, these guys, Peter is the oldest of the disciples and he is maybe in his early 20s, right? Maybe 20 years old. John is like 14, 15 years old. And if you've ever seen really young men and teenagers sort of interact, there is often some, um, a bit of, of, of competition, right? That there's camaraderie and there's connection, but there's always this sort of bit of con con competition there. Peter and John, they race to the tomb. Right? They, they race to the tomb, and John gets there first. And you can almost imagine, and I can imagine this really well as, as a 43-year-old who has an 11-year-old 
who is real close, real close to being able to smoke me when it comes to a foot race, right? He's close. He's not there yet. But I can imagine them getting there and Peter saying, yeah, yeah, you beat me here. Big deal. No one's ever going to know. And John says, oh, yeah. Read this next verse. John chapter 20, verse 4. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. It's as if John is saying, Peter, oh, no. They're going to remember. Let it be known forevermore that when the story of the resurrection is told, there will also be a little story about how John beat Peter to the tomb. And I mention this because he doesn't just say this one time, but you're going to see throughout this story that John does not let it go. Like he, he digs this in, like it's almost as if he's needling Peter over and over again. And so I'm going to mention that here and then I won't mention it again because I feel like I've, I've covered it well here. So he beat him to the tomb and Peter said, you got a head start. I don't know if Peter said you got a head start, but you know, he may have, right? But they were both running. He outran Peter. He reached the tomb first. And verse five, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. And there's no real explanation for why even though he outran Peter, even though he was there first, that he looked into the tomb, but he didn't go in. Some have suggested that it was enough for John that he saw that the tomb was empty, which meant that it satisfied him that Mary had told the truth that the tomb was empty. And so at this point, he's, he's satisfied that Mary's told the truth, that the tomb's empty. He has the information that he needs. But then verse 5 he saw, sees the cloths, but in verse 6, Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there. And then in verse 7, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. And so Peter goes, he's not satisfied simply to look inside, but you know, maybe he had just built up so much momentum, he, he couldn't stop. But he, he goes in to the tomb. And there he sees the linen cloth that has, has been seen by, by Mary Magdalene, that's been seen by John. But then he sees something else in the next verse. And that is that this, this head piece, this napkin that was, had been placed over Jesus' face, that it isn't lying in a, in a, a heap like the linen that was draped across his body, but that it's been, it's been treated differently. Years and years ago, I had to take a class on etiquette. And, you know, it was really a really educational, enlightening experience that you know, a, a rough young man from Northeast Texas really needed to try and sort of gentle my table manners. Right? And one of the things that we talked about was how you, if you're at a, a, a banquet or something where you are being served, how you indicate to your servers that you are done with a course. So, for instance, if you had to go to the, the restroom or something, that you would leave your cutlery in its proper place on the sides of your, your plate. You'd leave your, your knife over here, your fork over here. You'd leave them there. But when you were finished with a course, that you would take whatever cutlery you used on that course and you would leave it on the dish. And that was supposed to be an indication to the server that it was time to take that dish away and you could be served your next course. The number of times I've gotten to use that, twice. Like not, right, it's not very often. Like I, that just doesn't happen. I'm trying to teach my kids to serve us better, but it hasn't happened yet, right? Not a lot of multi-course meals in the Anthony home, so it hasn't meant much. But here's the thing that it, it reminds me of is that those table manners, those etiquettes, they come from places. And that part of, of etiquette it's kind of rooted in something else. In fact, your final thing that when you're done with your meal completely, if, if you have to get up, you would take your napkin and you'd put it on your chair. But when you're done with your meal, you take the napkin, you fold it, and you put it on your plate. In ancient Israel, in the time of Jesus, that was a, a show of etiquette. That when the master was finished with his meal, when he was finished with his meal, he did one thing. But when he wasn't finished with his meal, he did a different thing. Guess what he did when he wasn't finished? He took the napkin 
he folded it and he left it there on the table. And this was a message to the servants to say, I am returning. See, Jesus' last words in, in, on the cross, he says, Tetelestai, it is finished. Meaning the work that he had to accomplish on earth was finished. But don't mistake it. The work was finished, it is finished, but Jesus was not finished. Jesus sends a message to Peter, to John, to all of us in this simple placement of a napkin to say, the master is returning. And the message wasn't lost. The message wasn't lost because what we see in verse 8, John verse 8, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, then he also went in and he saw and believed. He got the message. See, at first he just sees the linen and he thinks, oh, they've taken his body. Then he sees everything. He sees the napkin. He sees this little sign. He understands its meaning and he believes. He believes. Now, obviously, John had believed in Jesus in some way for years now because he's been following him from town to town, from place to place, left everything behind to follow Jesus. And so he had certain level of belief, but here he is believing something much greater. He isn't just believing that he, Jesus is a good teacher. He isn't just believing Jesus is a, a, a powerful rabbi. He's believing that Jesus' claims about, about going into the ground for three days, about about the sign of Jonah that three days and nights that he would be in the grave. He's believing those things. So it's more than the belief he's, he's had before. And then in verse 9, John tells us a, an interesting thing. So he saw and believed. And then in verse 9, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Right? He says... He started to believe in verse 8. In verse 9, he explains why this is a revelation. He says that it's important to note that in verse 8 that we, we started to believe because we didn't yet fully understand the scriptures that said that he would have to rise from the dead. Sometimes we can see, you know, they, they say you know, seeing is believing. And sometimes there is there's something kind of absent in that that dynamic of seeing and believing, and that is understanding. Because sometimes we'll see something and we'll believe something, but we may not understand exactly what it is that we've seen. There was, when we lived in Waco, there was a, a young man who was a street magician, and he made a living by going into locally owned restaurants, and he would go from table to table, and he would do magic, really close up magic. And he, when he saw us, like he just, he always came to us because my kids were just like, whoa, just minds blown, right? And he would do a trick where he would take a pen, right? He would take a pen and not a pen that he brought. He would find, like he'd ask us for our pen. And he would take our pen and in front of our faces, he would make it disappear. And my son, who was, you know, just, I guess, five or six at the time, he saw it and he believed that he made the pen disappear. Right? I saw it and I believed that he tricked me, right? That's, that was what I believed. I saw something, I believed, you, I, you tricked me. I don't know how you did it. I don't have any understanding of how you did what you just did right in front of me. And then like, he would do it again and again. Like he would just, like, it was almost like he was just rubbing your, your nose in it. Like this is how good I am and how dumb you are. Like, All right, here, have some money, go away. Um, but that was, that was the thing, right? We could see and we could believe, and our belief would be different based on our own understanding. John here, he has believed. He has seen the signs, and he has believed things about Jesus. And I, I think that everything that John saw Jesus do, and every belief he developed about Jesus was right, but it wasn't complete. It was all right, but it wasn't complete. Sometimes I, when I get the chance to, to talk to somebody, to lead them down the plan of salvation and talk to them about the Lord, sometimes I will talk to somebody, especially this happens with children, where they've been brought up in the church and they have all the right answers, 
right? They, they know, like they believe this, they believe this. Believe, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw in this like curveball question. And I'll say, so tell me then, um, if you died without believing in Jesus, what, happened, what would happen to you? You'd go to heaven. It's close. They believe everything the right way, except just a, a couple of things that they don't quite have the maturity. They don't quite have the understanding to understand God's righteous judgment. And and I'll say, oh man, that, that is. I am so excited that you are learning, that you are growing, and I know it'll be any day I'm going to be able to take you up there in the baptistry and baptize you. And you know, I've had one kid who even said, "Okay, well, if you don't baptize me, can I still take the juice that you guys drink and the cracker?" <sighs> soon, soon, okay, but soon. So John understood certain things. He believed the right things based on the signs he had seen, but his understanding was still lacking because they did not yet understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead and then verse 10 then the disciples went back to their homes they were satisfied that they had gone they had seen they had verified that what mary and the other witnesses had told them was true and so they go back home but not mary verse 11 but mary stood weeping outside the tomb and as she wept she sto stooped to look into the tomb. She was impacted by this. She was overwhelmed. And there have been theologians who've tried to say why it is. Some people have said, you know, those who are forgiven much, love much, forgiven little, love little. It may have been that she was forgiven much and because of that she loved so deeply. It may have been grief, it may have been weeping over Israel and they have been weeping over the guilt of her people who would send Jesus to the grave. I tend to think that it isn't one thing though. I tend to think that it isn't just one thing because I don't think that there's ever been a time that I have sat with someone in the midst of mourning and they could really put a pin on the one thing. Because when you're suffering loss, it isn't one thing, it's everything. And it's, it's a new thing every moment, every few seconds. It's a new thing. It's another thing. And, and they won't be here for this. And they won't be able to do this. And I can't do this anymore. And I want to say this. And I want to tell him this. And it's all of these things. And I tend to think that she was there and just so overwhelmed that she didn't want to return home right then. That she wanted to just be connected to Jesus even though his body wasn't there. To just be in the place that she last saw him and in verse 12 she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain one at the head and one at the feet they said to her woman why are you weeping she said they have taken away my Lord I do not know where they have laid him they have taken away my Lord she wants to spend some time with Jesus even if at this point, Mary thinks it's just a body. She wants to spend that time. I tell you, I have uh, done quite a few funerals in the last couple of years. Look, looking to do one next weekend, did one last weekend. And perhaps the most valuable thing that as a pastor that I really get to do at a funeral has, is probably has nothing to do with what I say up here. I think maybe the most valuable thing that I can do at a funeral is convince the family to spend time with the body before the funeral. Spend time with the body before the funeral because there, there is just something about being able to have some time with your loved one's remains to say the things that you didn't say or, to, or conversely to say the things that you said a thousand times one last time. I, I have seen people in those moments when just the family and, and the pastor was there say things and weep. I've seen people put in a pack of cigarettes in their jacket pocket and say, I told you you should have stopped, but if smoking's allowed in heaven, 
you've got your brand, the things you have to say. I think Mary wants to say those things. She wants to have that time to prepare his body. In verse 14, having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. You know, John and Peter, they arrived at the destination. They saw the sign and they understood, but Mary has arrived at the destination and she didn't even know it. She's arrived at the destination. She sees the resurrected Lord and she doesn't know that she is there. That the promises of all those years of ministry, of all those messages talking about the redemption of mankind, talking about the forgiveness of sin, that all of those things are, are reaching almost their zenith in front of her eyes and yet she doesn't know it. And in verse 15, Jesus says to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, Rabboni, which means teacher. In the midst of her grief, she hears Jesus call her name. And her response is to call his name back. And, and we get a sense from how he responds that you can almost see it, that she is reaching for him. Right? She hears her name, she sees him, and she reaches out for him, and he stops her. In verse 17, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Jesus says, don't get so attached to this body, because I'm here just for a little while. Don't cling to this, but know that there is something that has to happen. There's more to this story. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. When we follow the signs, when we follow these signs, it's important, I think, that we do four things. First, I think we have to follow the right signs. We have to follow the right signs. And I, I love that in the book of John, John makes it clear, this is a sign of who Jesus is. He makes these signs very clear. Sometimes we look for signs where there is not a sign. I think it would have been really easy for people in Jesus' time to have missed the signs because they were looking at the wrong ones. For instance, Jesus was a carpenter. His Hands, if you've seen a carpenter's hands, um, they are not as delicate as a piano player's hands, right? There'll, there'll be scars. He used, he worked with wood. He used hammers and chisels and saws, right? His hands were probably, before the nail scars, they were probably already pretty banged up. And someone might have looked at Jesus' hands and said, he has the hands of a carpenter. What kind of rabbi has the hands of a carpenter. How could the unblemished lamb of God have hands that look like a carpenter's hands? I mean, consider this. When Jesus was calling his first disciples, a disciple says, can anything good come from Nazareth? Like they see the town where he was from, they read it as a sign, and they out of hand begin to doubt who Jesus is before ever even meeting him. So we have to make sure that we follow the right signs. The second thing is we have to make sure that we follow them the right way. The Pharisees saw the right signs. They see him healing. They see him changing people's lives. They see the signs very clearly and they don't doubt him. They don't doubt his power. They don't doubt that he has truly healed a man born blind. They don't doubt that he raised Lazarus from the dead. They believed it so fully that they start searching for Lazarus. And there becomes a conspiracy to kill Lazarus to take away the evidence of how powerful Jesus was. Oh, they saw the signs. They believed the signs. 
but they followed them in the wrong direction. Because they said, no, 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 this can't stand. We can't let this Jesus, this Nazarene, we can't let him rise to prominence. They saw the signs, but they took them the wrong way. We have to, if we're going to follow the signs, we have to reach the right destination. We have to reach the right destination. And the empty tomb was the right destination for a follower of Jesus. That empty tomb is, is where we're going. Judas followed the signs. He saw who Jesus was. He identified Jesus as the Messiah. But he didn't make it to the empty tomb. He couldn't make it to the empty tomb because when Judas thought of the Messiah, when he thought of Jesus, the destination that Judas wanted to arrive at was an earthly kingdom. He wanted Jesus to be an earthly king, and he tried to force his hand in that direction. He saw the signs. He followed him the right direction, but he didn't get to the right destination. Friends, we have to get to the right destination. We can't say, teacher. When Jesus calls our name, we can't say, teacher. Now, I love that she calls him Rabbani because that's what she's probably called him for years. Right? It, I think it's a really beautiful moment. But I, I bet that's the last time she calls him teacher. I bet that any point forward when she would see him, he's not teacher anymore. I bet when she goes and stands before him in glory, she doesn't call him teacher. She calls him Lord. Yeah, he goes from being Rabbani to Adonai pretty quick when you understand what the empty tomb is all about. We can't let people reach the wrong conclusions. It isn't enough for someone to believe that Jesus is a, a good person. It isn't enough to believe that Jesus was a powerful teacher. It isn't even enough for someone to say that Jesus was a holy man. Jesus is the Son of God, and nothing else will do. Jesus is the, the second person of the Trinity, existing eternally in fellowship with our Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit of God. He is God in His very essence, nothing less will do. If people reach any destination other than that understanding of who Jesus is, they've missed it. They've missed it, and they'll call him Rabbi forever until they one day call him judge. They need to know him as Lord, not just a teacher, not anything less. When we follow the signs, we have to follow the right signs, follow them the right way. We have to reach the right destination. But the last thing is that we have to respond the right way. Our response to reaching the proper destination has to be like Mary's is here. She may have called him by the wrong name, but she responded the right way. Because he says, go and tell the brothers that I'm alive, that I'm ascending to the Father, your Father, to my God, to your God. Go and tell them. And Mary goes. She, she probably, probably within her heart, there was a desire to, to stay. Now, I kind of wonder about that. I wonder if, if Jesus appeared to me in a corporeal form, he bodily appeared to me and he told me to do something. I wonder, I wonder if I wouldn't want to linger at his feet for just a little longer. I wonder if, if Jesus wouldn't have to, you know, have you ever tried to leave a, a three-year-old behind somewhere, right? And they sit on your foot and they wrap their arms and legs around you. I kind of think that I might would just do that. If he says, Chip, go and do this, I might say, no, Lord, listen, this world is awful. Don't send me out there. Let me just stay with you. I want to say, Lord, listen, this place, don't get me wrong, the sunsets are nice, but death is horrible. And I'm tired of it, and I'm tired of the mourning, and I'm tired of the loss, and I'm tired of the fighting. 
I'm tired of war. I'm tired of disease. I'm tired of so many things, Lord. I'm just going to wrap here around your foot and I'm going to sit for, can we compromise on an hour or, or two? But the Lord said, go, and Mary goes. We reach the right conclusion. We have to respond the right way. When Jesus goes on in verse Verse 21, Jesus appears to his disciples and he says to them, peace be with you as the father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And they go, and they go. Church, peace be with you. And even as Jesus has sent Mary Magdalene and even as Mary, Jesus has set the disciples, even still he is sending you. And I, I love being here and singing Jesus, 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 because there is something about that name. I love, I love thinking that, that I will have a little talk with Jesus, you know, make it right. I, I love being here and worshiping together but the message for us is that we are people who are sent into this world. That Jesus is saying, go. And as wonderful, as glorious as we find our times of worship, as we find times of fellowship, we have to go. We have to go. Friday afternoon, I got to have lunch with our widows group. And um, they're having lunch again next, next Friday. And they invited me to go, and uh, I want to go. In fact, I want to be a part of the North Orange Baptist Church Widows Group because you would be hard-pressed to find a better group of people to spend your time with, right? They're, they're lovely. They're wonderful. And they laugh at my jokes, unlike my own kids, right? Like, but here's the thing about that, that group of ladies Every one of them is bound for glory. Every one of you. And, and you can go there about 100 years from now. You can go. Not anytime soon, right? But they're all bound for glory. And we live in a city that isn't. And we live in a community that's not. And I have neighbors on my street that aren't bound for glory. I have neighbors on my street that are bound for hell. And as much as I would love to sit and eat lunch with those ladies at least once a week, especially if y'all buy my lunch. I don't know who bought my Dr. Pepper, but I appreciate it, right? As much as I would love that, I've not been called to do just that. We go, we go. And so we've spent these weeks looking at the signs. And I hope that you have been convinced by the signs of who Jesus is I hope that you've seen the right signs, that you have followed them in the right direction. I, I pray that you have reached the right destination. But ultimately, the question before us is, will you respond in the right way? Will you go? Will you go and tell them that Jesus did not stay in that tomb? Will you go and tell this world that Jesus has ascended to the right hand of his heavenly Father? Will you go and tell them that Jesus loved them so much that he that he went to the cross for them. Will you go and tell this world that message? Because just as any destination that leads you, any destination where you say that Jesus is anything other than the Son of God is a wrong destination, any response where you see that Jesus is Lord and you say no is wrong. You cannot call him Lord and say no. So if he is our Lord, we respond by saying, yes, Lord, and amen. I don't know what Jesus is calling you to do today. I know that he's calling you to share the gospel. I know that he's calling you to share the gospel in this community, in the communities you visit, in your place of work, in your place of business, in the places that you frequent, in Market Basket and Kroger and HEB and even Walmart, right? This is where he is calling us. He is calling us to share the gospel. My hope is that we would all say, yes, Lord, we will go. Let's pray together.
Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Lord, and we thank you that you have called us to go. Lord, we would love to sit at the destination. We would love to be able to just sit at your feet. We would love to be able to just fellowship with the saints. But Lord, we know that you have called us to the lost and the dying. So I pray, Lord, that you would burden us, that we would go. I pray that you would give us opportunities that are clear, that we would see the signs that you put in front of us and that we would follow them to reach people in this town. Lord, I pray that we would be a church that is on a mission to save Orange, Texas, that we are on a mission to point people to Jesus. Lord, I pray if there's any here this morning that doesn't know you, that they have not followed the signs to their completion, that today might be the day of salvation, that they reach that destination and they don't call you teacher, but they call you Lord. Lord, if there's any here this morning that says, I want to be a part of a church that is pointing people to Jesus, I want to be a part of North Orange, I pray that you would move in their heart today, that they could say that this is a place for them to join the mission. I pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Stand with me as you're able. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation, Just As I Am. <laughs>